Kia ora team. I hope you're all doing okay today. So, I'm appearing to you online as we head back into online learning again. Our focus for this week is going to be understanding how hominins emerged from Africa. Uh, and uh, this little meme, uh, I hope that speaks to you a little bit. Uh, but I hope also uh, that the reason why you'd be giving uh, that particular face is because we've done AS91602. We've looked at how to critique and understand socio-scientific issues. So hopefully uh, all those memes that you're seeing online uh, are giving you a bit of a pause for thought. So what's our plan? What's our terotaki for today? Well, there's a few slides I'd like to go through that were covered last week, but we didn't have an opportunity to discuss in class. Then we're going to talk about um, the focus for this week, what work needs to be done. We're going to talk about Homo erectus ergaster, and we're going to talk about the two uh, models that might explain uh, how uh, hominins emerged from Africa and eventually became us. And then we're going to look at the evidence that supports each of these models. So let's go into uh, the content that we missed last week. So first piece of content uh, was trends in dentition. So if you look on the left there, you can see Australopithecus afarensis. Um, Australopithecus, uh, Pithecus, Australopithecus afarensis, um, aka Lucy, had a very different jaw and teeth structure uh, than uh, we did. And there's some general trends that I want you to make note of here. Um, there was a reduction in jaw size over time, um, and there was a change in the dental profile from being a V-shape to a U-shape, as well as if you look at the canines there in particular, you can see that those canines on Australopithecus afarensis are a whole lot spikier than the ones that we've got today. Um, the reasons for this, the driving factors, were that as we developed the ability to cook our own food and to be able to uh, hunt game and all of this kind of stuff, um, we didn't need those strong jaw muscles that you need and those big teeth that you need for ripping and tearing. Um, additionally, one of the changes that occurred in our jaws is the development of the chin. Now, we talked about spandrels. Uh, in our class last week and uh, the idea that some structures are there initially to support but might be a, a or developed into a second purpose at a later stage in the evolutionary pathway. Um, the chin, one of the proposals for what it's for, is that it's one of these. It originally was there to support big chomping motions uh, but more recently, I'm talking in the last couple million years, it's become a sexual selector, um, which is evidence perhaps of uh, healthy development um, or uh, some other signal uh, to a mate. So uh, one of the possible reasons why uh, jaw lines are considered to be attractive um, is that they are actually a sexual selection mechanism, a spandrel of a time gone by when we needed big strong jaws uh, for chomping and eating. So that's an interesting idea. The other thing that we wanted to discuss is the Laetoli footprints. So I'm going to read this quote for you because I think it's pretty beautiful. So the fossil footprints were rather whimsically discovered by exhibition curator Andrew Hill when visiting Mary Leakey, as seen here on the right, in 1976. While walking back to camp one evening, Hill fell trying to avoid a large ball of elephant dung uh, thrown at him by a colleague. Uh, with his face only inches from the rock, uh, he recognised the footprints that were made by antelopes and rhinos preserved in the volcanic ash. And among these, hominid footprints. So uh, what these footprints show, as you can sort of see on the right there, is there uh, were three hominids, uh, one big one, uh, one medium-sized one, and one with its footprints uh, nice and small inside the footprints of the largest hominid. All of them are heading in the same direction. Um, and uh, the, this sort of raises some questions. Um, you know, you might have in your mind that there was uh, possibly a, a father on the right and a mother on the left walking hand in hand as a little baby uh, hopped in the little uh, footprints of the father. Uh, that might be, you know, a little bit of an exaggerated story because we don't know 
um, whether this was a pair, whether this was three hominids, um, whether this was, you know, uh, 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 whatever it was, whether they all work, they all were uh, walking together. Um, but uh, it gives us pause for thought about uh, how these hominids migrated, and maybe you know it gives us a little bit of a poetic understanding that these organisms were not too far away from us. Um, you know, millions of years ago, uh, wandering across the the savanna. Um, there were there were families there too, um, I guess is what the story is about. Uh, I think it's really beautiful, which is why I like sharing it. And there's some more information in the slides there if you'd like to look that up. But let's move on to the content for this week. So the Te Rautaki Te Wiki, the plan for the week, is that we're going to give you uh, some slides and you're going to work through those and there's some additional resources in there for you. Uh, the key thing to note is that there's a few small tasks in there, um, and some of them do require iPads, but Miss McNair has made those pages available electronically for you on Google Classroom. Additionally, uh, your primary focus for this week is to fill out your notes using the note-taking framework on Google Classroom. If you could hand this in on Friday, that would be phenomenal. Um, there are a variety of videos which will support you filling out these notes. And this video that we're recording now uh, is just servicing those key ideas. Uh, those additional videos will flesh those ideas out and hopefully uh, increase your understanding and make those notes a little bit deeper. Um, for my class, it's important to know that on Wednesday at 2.10, period 5, uh, we'll be doing uh, a Google Meet uh, with a Q&A followed by a Kahoot. So come along to that. Lastly, if you're in my class, could you please complete the weekly reflection on Google Classroom? I'd like to know how you're all doing and how we can best support you as we transition back to online learning. So let's get into the content for today. First thing we need to know, Homo ergaster, the working man. So this is sometimes known as uh, the African Homo erectus or Homo erectus ergaster. Uh, what do we know about them? They lived 1.9 to 1.5 million years ago in Eastern Africa. They were the first hominin with a human uh, uh, body shape and proportions, which you can see there on the right. That particular example was found in uh, Ethiopia um, and uh, is a, a, a 7 to 12 year old uh, boy. Um, at least that's what it's been molded on the skeleton uh, that was found. Uh, we uh, believe that they are the first hominins to have left the African continent, uh, continent along with Homo erectus. And uh, they were also built for this long distance travel um, and had a bunch of features which supported this. Uh, we also have found them alongside uh, particular tools uh, from the Archulian era, which we will talk to you about at a later stage. Uh, but what these were, were um, somewhat sophisticated tools which allowed for uh, cutting and cleaving, and they were hand axes, um, quite useful tools for adapting to new environments. There's also some evidence uh, that they were able to use and control fire, which might have assisted in them uh, being able to gain more nutrients from their food by cooking, uh, but we'll come to that at a later stage. Additionally, Homo erectus, so the current best information that we have, is that Homo erectus is now believed to be a side branch in our family tree, whereas Homo ergaster is now viewed as a direct ancestor of our Homo sapiens. So what you're looking at there on the right is perhaps your great 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 great, great times by very many um, cousin. Uh, and there's some more info uh, on page 266 of your SciPad uh, if you wanted to learn about Homo ergaster. Okay, some key ideas about leaving Africa and some key questions that we need to be considering. So, the first dispersal from Africa occurred somewhere around 2 million years ago, about 1.8 million years ago, um, and Homo ergaster was the one to do it. They left Africa, spread into Europe, spread into Asia, and uh, along the course of their journey, they would have interacted with a variety of different environments at that particular point in time. There are some questions. What made this the species to leave Africa? Why didn't the species before them leave? Well, first things first, we talked about those older hominin species having a bit of trouble with walking 
because they were transitioning from that brachiation, uh, they had different developments in their pelvis and in uh, those, those angles that we've been talking about there, uh, which might not have supported gaits for long distance. Homo ergaster, on the other hand, had a body well suited to traveling long distances. Uh, additionally to that, they had a high degree of intelligence, which allowed them to adapt to new environments. And we can see that by the size of their craniums relative to the rest of their bodies. Um, they had tools, those Archulean tools, which would have assisted in them adapting those new environments to suit their needs. And lastly, uh, we think that they used fire, which might have meant that their diet included more meat or more cooked meat, which would have greatly uh, fueled their uh, brains, allowing them to think about harder. Uh, so that leaves us with a question. If Homo ergaster established over Asia and, and Europe, uh, how would this dispersal produce a different hominid species? Um, and there's some ideas that might immediately spring to mind, but hopefully you're remembering that concept from level two. If you have reproductive isolation, you're unable to interbreed because you're separate, then uh, over time you have the development of changes which results in uh, differences in the populations which can be so stark that you're unable to interbreed. It's thought that Homo ergaster uh, is the, the uh, ancestor of Homo neanderthalensis as well as possibly Homo denisovians and a few of those others that uh, you might have encountered as we've been doing this research on this topic. Uh, additional points you need to know. So approximately 125 to 60,000 years ago, there was a second immigration from Africa, this time by the species Homo sapiens. Now this species would have gradually replaced uh, the other hominid species in uh, Asia and Europe, um, as we saw these dying out at about that particular point in time. And this dispersal into Eurasia occurred at the same time as um, some particular points in our geological history. So um, the previous ice age um, started about 100,000 years ago. This would have allowed the formation of a whole bunch of land bridges, which would have allowed those, uh, those Homo sapiens, those early Homo sapiens, to more easily travel, uh, particularly uh, up the top, up in the north there, across and down into uh, the Americas. So key points from those last two slides. Two big waves, one by Homo ergaster 1.8 million years ago, and one by Homo sapiens about 100,000 years ago. Um, and you should be aware that there are several reasons that this was possible um, at each of these waves, and you should be able to discuss those ideas. There are two theories about uh, how modern humans were formed relating to these two waves. So, uh, First idea, multi-regional model. So the idea was that Homo erectus left Africa about 2 million years ago, 1.8 million years ago, spread into Europe and Asia. Homo sapiens then evolved simultaneously in these archaic populations and there was regular gene flow uh, between these somewhat separate populations. And that prevented full speciation because there was no reproductive isolation. Um, what that meant is that if an adaptation occurred in uh, a population, say, in Asia, then because of the interbreeding that was occurring relatively quickly you would see that adaptation uh, spread through the population and so uh, you would expect to see that occurring at the same time in the fossil record. Um, so in this particular model uh, all modern Homo sapiens are descended from Homo erectus who left Africa two million years ago um, and there is a single Homo sapien species rather than multiple species of hominid. Uh, you can see that represented in these diagrams here. So here we have our most recent common ancestor, and then we have some splitting uh, of the populations as they moved out of Africa uh, back with Homo erectus. And then over time, there was interbreeding between these populations, and then that resulted in modern populations prior to globalization. Uh, if this theory is correct, if the multi-regional hypothesis is the correct one, then we should see that those transitional forms uh, appeared in all regions at about the same point in time. And those traits uh, that are distinct between Homo uh, erectus and us, we should see developing in all populations, in all locations, at the same point in time. Uh, we should also see 
a high degree of genetic diversity in modern humans because that would indicate that our species is old. Uh, we would also see no difference between the amount of genetic variation in African populations compared to populations in Asia uh, or Europe or elsewhere. You would expect that all those populations would have about the same uh, amount of genetic diversity were this hypothesis true. The other model, the out of Africa model, uh, suggests that modern Homo sapiens evolved in Africa and then expanded out. There was no wandering interbreeding uh, between that Homo erectus population, or at least that wasn't the primary driver. Uh, the idea is that some Homo sapiens left Africa about 100,000 years ago, and they migrated and then replaced those earlier migrants. So you saw the archaic Homo erectus populations uh, die off, the Homo neanderthalensis populations die off, the Homo denisovians uh, uh, populations die off, um, and those were replaced by uh, Homo sapiens. Uh, if this is true, then what we should see in the fossil record is that the uh, transitional forms between Homo sapiens and Homo erectus should only be found in Africa. Additionally, uh, we should see that uh, the traits that make us who we are, those differences between Homo erectus and us, should appear in Africa first, and then at a later stage, they should appear uh, across the remainder of the world. Uh, and in fact, if, if you could track it in the geological record and see progression from Africa elsewhere, uh, that would be a really strong indication of that. Additionally, we should see low genetic diversity within the entire human population uh, because uh, our species originated uh, in Africa only um, and only maybe 100,000 years ago. Uh, and additionally, uh, populations in Africa would show the greatest genetic diversity in populations that were founded later uh, for the reasons that we discussed in level two, talking about founder effects, we're talking about genetic bottleneck, we're talking about all these sorts of things. Those other populations would show significantly less genetic variation uh, than populations in Africa. Uh, a note here that within the fossil record, you'd probably see Homo sapiens and those archaic populations coexisting at certain points in time, as replacement wouldn't have been uh, absolutely inst instantaneous. But what you'd expect is that uh, there, after that, you would see the Homo sapiens uh, uh, being present. Uh, so I believe that makes sense. <clears throat> So we have some evidence, and we have to look at that evidence and consider which of these models is most likely to be correct. So the first piece of evidence is mitochondrial DNA. You may know that mitochondria have their own DNA. We use the little symbol MT in front of DNA to distinguish this. And it's found, uh, there's lots of it in the egg, uh, but almost very, uh, very little in sperm. And it's mostly found in the tail of sperm. So it is uh, very rare for a paternal mitochondrial DNA to be passed on. But uh, you, your mitochondrial DNA will primarily come from your maternal line. Um, the only source of variation uh, is uh, mutations. So there's no recombination event going on because you haven't got that introduction of a second set of uh, DNA. Uh, and as a result, because mutations occur at a particular frequency, we can figure out their likelihood of occurring and then use it as kind of a molecular clock to trace back uh, how old particular populations are, um, which is quite a, a neat little piece of scientific work. So, mitochondrial Eve. A New Zealand scientist named Alan Wilson tested the mitochondrial DNA of 137 people uh, all over the world. Um, and what he found was their mitochondrial DNA could be traced back to one mitochondrial DNA sequence that existed somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago. And that sequence would have been a single person, uh, which he called uh, mitochondrial Eve. And uh, this lineage replaced all the other lineages over time. Now, if we can trace most people or all people back to a single person or a couple of people, what theory does that support? Hopefully we've got some ideas, particularly because that was 100,000 or 200,000 years ago. Second thing, the Y chromosome and our MRCA, so most recent common ancestor, 
Uh, Miss McNair's put up YMCA as a little song for you to think about, like M-R-C-A, uh, hopefully for you to help, you know, gel in your mind about what's going on there. So our most recent male common ancestor uh, from all humans have descended is referred to as the Y chromosome Adam. Uh, and the inherited DNA uh, in this particular instance is uh, uh, what uh, a single Y chromosome would have looked like that uh, is largely unchanged throughout all males. If you trace back uh, Y chromosome DNA and look for differences and look at the rate of mutation over time, because remember there's no crossing over of the Y chromosome, what you find is that Adam would have lived uh, somewhere between 120 to 200,000 years ago, though there is some recent evidence that might even suggest as recent as 60,000 years ago, which is pretty wild. So we've got some evidence from the Y chromosome, we've got some evidence from mitochondria. Uh, now, we've also got some evidence in the form of some advanced DNA techniques, which is important for us to discuss. So. Some of our fossil humans are well preserved enough for us to be able to sequence the entire genome of these organisms. So Neanderthalensis was completed in 2010 through this particular method. What we found is that um, the sequence of DNA um, in people in Europe and Asia, so the Eurasian genome, uh, is about 1 to 4% Neanderthalensis DNA. What that indicates. Uh, is that those people were interbreeding, uh, at least to some extent, with Neanderthalensis back in the day. Uh, additionally to this, if you look at the genomes of people in Africa, they show no sign of Neanderthalensis genes, at least um, uh, populations of people who haven't uh, got ancestral lineage to Europe and Asia. What does this show? Well, hopefully from that combination of evidence, we're thinking we've been present longer in Africa than everywhere else, and we're thinking that, uh, therefore, it's very likely that a subset of the African population left the continent and colonized the rest of the world uh, about 100,000 years ago. Additionally, we've got some other things in here that are important for us to know. So Denisovans, uh, there is some evidence from a finger bone in this particular Siberian cave uh, known to be hand, uh, to inhabited by Neotelensis and Homo sapiens. Um, and the mitochondrial analysis of this shows that Denisovans are genetically distinct from uh, the Homo sapien populations as well as even Homo neanderthalensis. Um, the evidence suggested that Denisovans shared a common ancestor with Neanderthals, and about 3-6% to of the DNA in uh, people in East Asia, Melanesia, and uh, the uh, native peoples of Australia uh, share DNA with Denisovans, which is a fascinating discovery because what does it show? It shows that Homo sapiens interbreeded with other hominins as well. Uh, so, with those thoughts in mind, hopefully we're aware that most of the genetic evidence supports the Art of Africa model. The humans as a species show very little genetic diversity, so only about 100,000 years worth of genetic diversity, max 200,000. And because Homo sapiens emerged from Africa, those populations in Africa had the greatest genetic diversity, or populations still living in Africa have the greatest genetic diversity. And non-African populations tend to be more similar to each other and show some interbreeding with other hominins that might have existed in the regions they, uh, their ancestors migrated to. Um, so, if we look back at whether uh, this information supports uh, the Art of Africa model, hopefully you should be able to understand uh, why this information does support that model over the multi-regional model, um, and understand how to communicate that uh, in your uh, uh, essays at the end of the year. So. There are these resources and SciPad pages are available for you to have a little bit of a look at. But I think that just about does it for us today. I think I've done enough talking. Um, and uh, I hope that you all have a lovely time at home, that everything is going okay. Please make sure that you fill out the weekly reflection for this week if you're in my class. 
Uh, I'd really appreciate knowing how everything is going. Uh, and I look forward to seeing you at our Google Meet later this week. All right, look after yourselves. Kakite, mate wa.